Well, thank you guys so much for all coming out tonight, especially right after a long holiday weekend. It's really great to see you all here. And, you know, it feels fitting that after I spent months asking you questions, <laughs> that we're commemorating the release of the book by having me ask Amy more questions. It just seems, seems like the right thing to do. What haven't I told you already? I don't know. Probably not very much, but uh, some of these questions may be repeats, but for the benefit of the audience, we'll uh, revisit some, some material that is covered in the book. Uh, and I wanted to kind of start at, at the beginning. A lot of people are surprised, given how beloved this movie is, that 20 years ago, first it was at Fox and then it got dropped and then you had to kind of shop it around before you could find a home for it, that there were people who didn't Everybody want to make it. Everybody in Hollywood passed on it. Everybody said no. Every studio went, nah. Um, so that could be depressing and sometimes you think, oh, so that's not going to happen and you kind of give up. Um, and in many cases that's your only option. Um, I was very fortunate to have an agent who believed in it and wouldn't let it die and kept plugging away. Do you remember some of the reasons people didn't want to make it? Some of the maybe less logical reasons that people didn't want to make it? Well. Hollywood, they, they say, is known for the um, rearview mirror philosophy, which is what you see in front of you is actually what's behind you. So if a movie with, um, you know, three girls made money, then they would look for their next three girls movie. If a movie with a superhero made money, they're looking. So they're looking for what just happened. It's better to be behind than ahead of the curve. Um, so everybody uh, didn't want to do this because it was called Clueless and that sounds like young people and not intelligent. Um, and there had been a couple of movies uh, with that sort of theme. Um, one was Airheads, which was a very funny movie. It was Adam Sandler, it was Steve Buscemi, and Brendan Fraser, and they were like musicians, and they were kind of like stupid. I mean, the way they went about what they were doing. But I thought it was really charming. It didn't perform the way the studios wanted it to perform. There was another one called PCU, Politically Correct University, with Jeremy Piven and David Spade and I don't know who else, but um, that was kind of like young people acting kind of snarky. And um, it was, again, a funny movie, but it, these movies were not making the kind of money the studio wanted. I think there were a couple of others that, just because of the titles, they were worried. Like, no, we want to see, I don't know what the hell they wanted to see that year. Um, but in any case, it wasn't something where young people in a movie called Clueless. So that took care of that. It's an automatic pass. They don't have to explain anything to their bosses. Oh, but this is blah, blah, blah. They just, yeah, it sounds like you shouldn't do it. So they didn't. But obviously Scott Rudin, who produced it, uh, he saw something in it that other people did not, and that's how it got um, off the ground. When, when it got to Scott, finally, um, and he read it, he got it. And then um, when the word got out that Scott Rudin was going to be the producer, there was a bidding war because a bunch of studios then wanted to do it. So their deep, deep beliefs of not wanting to do it were suddenly changed to like, no, we do want to do it. Um, because they are known for really what they feel inside and standing by those, those beliefs. <laughs> So I wanted to talk just a little bit about casting the movie, um, and specifically Alicia Silverstone, who, uh, as lore goes, you saw in an Aerosmith video, and obviously you felt like she was your share. Talk about what qualities, what, what it was you saw in Alicia that made you so certain she was the right person for the part. Well, the first video I saw was crying, with Alicia um, being upset, wearing a plaid shirt, and going to a coffee shop and her purse is stolen, a bunch of bad things happen to her, and then she's standing on a ledge over a bridge. I don't know if this rings a bell with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then she jumps down, and then she is actually bungee cord jumping, and she gives the finger and she's happy. Um, and I just, I don't know, my heart went out to her. I thought, 
there's something about her that makes me care about her. There's something so endearing about her. And then, of course, came the other videos where she's like a guy's sexual fantasy in a, a computer um, on a motorcycle. And then there was another one where she was with Liv Tyler and they were being two sexy girls. <laughs> so I just liked her. I thought, I want to see what this girl is doing next. And apparently other people did because they put her in all those videos. So I, um, when I showed 20th Century the Fox um, the script, I also gave them a video I, I taped while I was waiting through MTV for her to be on again. And um, taped it, gave it to them. And they said, with the dark haired girl? I went, no, the other one. Um, and uh, they just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. But eventually they did, because well, she obviously got the part. She got the part when it was at Paramount. Right, yeah. right, right. And then as far as casting Josh, it was a very different process in that it took you a while to figure out. You saw a lot of different people trying to find just the right guy. Um, there were um, a lot of people to see. Mm -hmm. And I saw him, and I loved him, and he was the only one that was like... Yeah, finally, because I, I wasn't liking anybody for the part. And um, then he thought he didn't have it because I didn't tell him he had it right away. Because I couldn't, because it wasn't completely up to me. I had to go through the process of seeing all these people that were out there. Um, so I was still casting, and he cut his hair, and I saw him in a restaurant. I went, what did you do? And he said, what? And I said, you cut your hair. I, you know, I wanted you to be Josh, and, and I didn't want your hair so short. And he was like, I didn't hear anything. I assumed I didn't get it. I said, but you, these things take time. I got to see all these actors. You know, it's not, you know, I don't, I can't just say, oh, you're cute. You got the part. It's, <laughs> you know, all these agents have all their clients, and all the executives want you to see all the people that their friends who are agents tell them that they have to see. And you can't just go, no, I know I like this guy. But uh, obviously you worked around the haircut because uh, yeah. he, he got the part. And he, he got the part. I wish his hair was a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see him in Ant-Man, his hair is longer. He looks great, right? <laughs> So fast forwarding a little bit to the start of production, um, and specifically the first day of shooting, which was, that was at Grant High School. Yeah. It's the debate scene. Tell people what you remember about the first, first day of shooting, what it felt like to get started. Well, um, Grant High School was kind of a depressing place. There had just been a shooting there, uh, actually. Uh, there was, uh, there's a lot of crime in LA. Um, <laughs> and, there had also been an earthquake, and so uh, we were in Grand High School where, we had, where the shooting had just happened. Then we go to the mall where the earthquake had just happened. The fancy house that she lives in, they had earthquake things that they wanted to repair, so they wanted to rent the house out to us. Um, so, you know, reality is one thing, but I don't like to think about that. Uh, anyhow, so Cher is going to tell us um, about why we should let immigrants into America. And um, we had had readings before, and I, I had heard everything, but for, for some reason on that day, she had said Hadians, um, which was new, because she might have pronounced it right the other time, but she really didn't know, so she was just trying out different <laughs> things. Anyhow, so um, everybody on the crew was like ready to jump over to her after I said cut to tell her how to say it. And I had to make sure that nobody got near her because I didn't want her to know it was wrong. <laughs> I, wa <laughs> I wanted her to have that cockiness without knowing it's a joke. Um, so that was an unintentional joke that I really like and just sometimes there are happy accidents. 
And that kind of set, set the tone for the, the whole movie, didn't it? Just the kind of, like you said, a happy accident. Yeah, one time I had her taking pictures and she was saying to, um, to Elton, doesn't she look like one of those Botticelli chicks? Which I meant, uh, the girls in the Botticelli paintings, which are like, I think, the most beautiful paintings of females. And he's like, yeah, make me a print. And later on she comes, she goes, what's a Botticelli chick? Like she thought it was one word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I told her about Botticelli. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, <laughs> but when stuff like that happens, you can't, you know, you can't predict that. Yeah. So there's a section of the book where we talk a lot about the, the language in the movie and what sort of inspired some of the, um, the phrases and the slang. Uh, are there like things from the movie that have entered your lexicon that you say on a daily basis? I'm sorry to say that whatever works for so many things. <laughs> A few times in every sentence, practically. Um, and I know it's an annoying word. I, I once read this article, um, you know, on language that claimed it was the most annoying word of the year or something. But <laughs> I just like it. I mean, I don't think like, oh, I love that word. I just, it just comes out a lot. Um, and when you think too much about how you're talking, you get very stifled. Like, once I was doing an interview, and my mother goes, stop saying you know. And then I couldn't think of what to say because I didn't know how to break up things without, I just got very stifled. Because <laughs> I was going, oh, I can't say you know. And I know I shouldn't say like all the time. But sometimes these things, they just, they come out. <laughs> All right, any other, do people ever come up and quote dialogue from the movie to you? Um, you know, not so much to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, you know, I've seen it happen to Wally, and um, I, I assume it happens to the others somewhat. Right. Right. I think I might know the answer to this question, but I want to ask it anyway. Um, do you have a favorite scene in the movie, either one that meant something to you personally while you were writing it, or that you just loved the way it turned out in the final, final version of the movie? Well, I don't know if it's like I love that scene versus other scenes, but the one that's like the most personal to my life is the freeway. Because um, <laughs> I can't, I'm a nervous driver, and um, I don't drive on the freeway. But every now and then you find yourself on a street or a ramp or in a lane that you cannot stop and turn around and it's going on to the freeway. <laughs> and then you go like, oh my fucking God, I'm going on to the freeway. <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it except like, you know, keep holding the wheel and screaming till you get off. Um, <laughs> and, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's very frightening to me. Um, you don't know if that's like too stupid, does that happen to anybody else? But I have to assume that the dumbest shit that happens to me probably happens to other people. <laughs> you know, because my mother said to thine own self be true, blah, 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 whatever. And, um, <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'll just write, the, you know, you're a young person learning to drive and, and it's kind of terrifying and that's probably makes sense there. You also have a legitimate reason for it, because you were in kind of a bad accident. Yeah, I was hit by a drunk driver who then drove away. Um, so, you know, I'm like, things coming at me, I get scared. But, uh, you know, that's not so humorous. <laughs> I mean, that's how I felt on the way over here. I wasn't driving, but just getting here through New York streets, you know. I understand New York that Street, I don't know. When I was a kid, and this has nothing to do with Clueless, but... Um, Whenever I would learn about some new horrible thing, like um, tornadoes or quicksand or, or whatever, and I'd say, Mommy, Mommy, you know, what's going to happen if there's a tornado, an earthquake, or a volcano? And she goes, they don't have tornadoes in New York, maybe in New Jersey. <laughs> they don't have quicksand in New York. There's no quicksand in New York, maybe in New Jersey. So I always thought, as long as you stay here, you're okay. <laughs> 
That's very funny. Um, <laughs> So uh, I wanted to talk again about the editing process as well. When I talked to you about it and to Debbie, who was the editor on the project, mm -hmm. it sounded like it was a pretty smooth process. I mean, relative to other movies you've worked on, what was it like editing Clueless versus other things that you've done? Um, well, uh, this one was like one that I wrote and also felt close to me. So, um, And there was very little uh, interference in any place. So that was... That was all good, so I just got to, I mean, there's not an endless amount of time or money, um, but I knew what I wanted, and then I got it, and then we put it together. So, I mean, Debbie always says it's like, a, you know, it's all very clear cut. It's just so you know exactly how it's going to go, and then you just pick your favorite takes, and there you go. It's, um, you're not going, all right. Can we like stick this in a blender and maybe something exciting will come out if, with the right music? Um, you know, sometimes you're just going, I gotta make something out of this somehow in some magical way. Um, that was just like, here it is, this happens and that happens and that happens and this happens and that happens. And it's like just very easy. Mm -hmm. You had to lose a few things, but it didn't sound like they were, you know, major scenes that you were really upset about. I don't think I even lost any full scene or anything. Um, there was, uh, we showed it to the studio, and um, Sherry Lansing, who was the head of the studio, who was like an amazing woman, um, there was one line where uh, Cher goes, looking for... Uh, you know, a great guy in high school is like looking for meaning and I had an Chevy Chase movie because I'm not a fan. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, Did we mention that she directed European Vacation? Yeah, I don't know why you put that one in. I've done others. <laughs> um, but in any case, so she said, ah, oh, you know, Chevy's a nice guy and he's big with these charities and he's a friend. Can you not do that? So I said, okay. Um, and I thought, well, looking for meaning in whose movie? And I mean, Paulie Shaw was kind of, had a lot of crazy movies that people might think they can mock because they're Paulie Shaw movies. They're not very deep. Um, they were fun. Uh, and I felt bad because I like Paulie Shaw. But sh she's the studio head and she likes Chevy Chase. So. <laughs> <laughs> So that was really the only major, major change. That was the only change change from like, mm -hmm. here's the movie, what do you want to do to it? Just finish it, take out the Chevy Chase line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I was watching it again last week and it's just, it's such a well-paced movie. Like nothing seems extraneous. Like it's just all belongs. You know, so much of that is the, the actors are not like waiting to like really feel it. They're like, you know, they're fully loaded and they have a pace and an energy and they're, you know. Mm -hmm. And they fill every moment. I mean, if you cut to Wally Shawn at any moment, it's not like he's waiting to say his line. He's like, he's thinking and you see what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at these kids going, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, he's like, you could see what's going on in his head. Yeah. So obviously the fashion in this movie is very, very important. Uh, if you had to choose one of the ensembles from the movie and you had to wear it, like, what one would you choose to wear in your personal life? Um, well, first of all, Alicia is a springtime colored person, and I'm a winter. <laughs> so I would not look good in any of her clothes. Um, I would say that I like the Aliyah dress, mm -hmm. but I don't want to say that because I asked them for a dress because I gave them such a good advertisement, and they didn't give me anything. So <laughs> I'm not going to say anything good about them. Um, and uh, I, there was an outfit we saw where it was black and white and it was just like a school outfit. And I said, I like that. And then Mona May, the costume woman, was going, if she wears that, Dion is going to totally overpower her. She has to step it up. She's Cher. She's got to like, you know, and Mona was losing sleep. And then one day Mona came in with like this yellow plaid and said, what do you think? And I was like, duh. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, let's go for that. Um, but I never would have thought of like, hmm, 
I'm coming to a book thing, I'll wear yellow plaid. I mean, it just, <laughs> it wouldn't occur to me. I would, I would wear your outfits. Because um, <laughs> I, I have coloring like you guys. Um, but other than that, uh, and also, I feel like if I'm wearing any bright colors, people will look at me going, who do you think you are? Like, um, I'm, I have color shyness. Personally, I, I like to put it in things, but on me personally, it scares me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember you saying that you deliberately, you and Mona, didn't want to have too much black in the movie um, because of the seasonal palette. It dragged palette. down the palette. Yeah. 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 There's a little uh, here and there, but not. Nobody really ever wears all black. Uh, no. No. Right. Um, so when the movie came out, obviously it did really well at the box office, but it also gave you like some of the best reviews of your career. And when I asked you about how it felt to, to get that kind of adulation, you said it was pretty mind-blowing. It's too much. <laughs> I mean, um, it's like, let's say you like are in Auschwitz and you're starving and somebody says, here's some roast beef and gravy and chocolate mousse pie. You would die if you ate that, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, not to make light of, of you know, horrible things that happened, but, um, you know, I just want a little bit of good at a time. I don't want a m stack of good shit to read at once. I just, you know, just like a couple of attaboys a day would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's like, I, I wish like, you know, when shit is happening and it's all bad for so long and then it's good, uh, but it's too much, it's like, you go, why can't these things be evened out a little? Or if I could like slaughterhouse five it and just go back and forth a little bit here, a little <laughs> bit there, just kind of bounce around in time, but I can't. <laughs> We were talking earlier about, you know, how difficult it was initially to, to find someone to, to back the project and to get it made. If you were trying to pitch Clueless now, do you think it would be harder or easier to get it made? It's always hard. By a major studio? By a major studio? Uh, no. I, no. I mean, it seems like it would be harder, just, I mean, obviously I'm an outsider, but it just seems like they're even, they want even more of a guarantee up front that something is going to make money. Um, and it's hard when it's an original piece that's not a part oh, of a franchise. I got to tell you something great. <laughs> um, there was a, um, a comic book movie that came out, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a sequel, but it was based on a comic book character stuff, right? Oh, which one was it? It's driving me nuts. But in any case, it did badly. And they, the studio heads, one of them, there was like some mail or something in between people, and it was like, this goes to show that we should not do any original stories. Like, original, it's a fucking a material that's already approved. That, but no, because the story wasn't a repeat of a story, a sequel, or an origin story to a story that's a story that you know. <laughs> it w there was a speck of originality, and that's why you didn't make any money. I mean, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, was there ever, I mean, obviously after the movie came out, then Clueless, the TV show happened. Yeah. Was there ever any conversation or thought in your mind about trying to do a follow-up as a movie or a sequel or anything like that? Mm, you know, it was, oh, Clueless goes to college. Just like, no. Um, the thing about coming of age, is when you come of age, then you're done, <laughs> you know? And finding the love of your life, and then you're done. Um, so those stories have an actual endings, and after that, you always go like, what, they're gonna start fighting, and then, then there'll be a, what then, what? I mean, you know, I didn't want to do Look Who's Talking too, because it's like, he said the words already, so that's done, but it was like, <laughs> No, you got to do it because of X, Y, and Z, or we won't cover you for the whatever. It was a long story, but I had no choice. Um, but they they want what they want, and if you did something that they liked a certain way, they want it again. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's hard. Mm -hmm. And also now more than ever, the middle has sort of dropped out because. Um, 
movies that were like medium budget, lower medium, um, are kind of really hard to get made. It's like there's the ones that are over a hundred million with some guys in tights, or there's like some, you know, females singing without any orchestration over some people on the street that would just grab the shots and, you know, no lighting or nothing. The, you know, so it's really small or really big. And I think it's kind of like when you see a country that has no middle class, that's really bad. It's like, yeah, it's great if poor people come and for a second they're poor, but they're able to work their way up. And, you know, some people get rich and that's okay, but there shouldn't be just poor and rich. There has to be a thriving middle. That's the strength of any place in any industry, I think. Mm -hmm. But what do I know? Anyway, <laughs> so that's kind of gone, and that's sad. Yeah. So I know that you've been working on the Clueless musical, which I want to ask you about in a second, but, uh, and you've had other projects you've been doing too, but do you have a next movie in your mind that you'd like to make? Um, it, that's a hard, because I, I wrote a thing, but then um, the person that I wrote it for, which actually I was kind of glad didn't want to do it because it would be better with some other people, and, but then they got a different producer and he had some notes, so, but I'm working on something else right now, so I got to, you know, wait a few weeks till I'm done with that, but the main mm -hmm. thing that I just want to do the musical. Yeah, t so t there were a lot of headlines generated recently when you were talking about the musical, I think, for Entertainment Tonight. Um, tell people sort of where you are with that. I know you've been working on it for a while. Not that long. <laughs> <laughs> a little while. Um, but, uh, okay, so the woman that did Rock of Ages, the director, is the director. I'm not, I wrote the, what they call the book, and I feel phony saying that, but it's the play or the whatever that you use, um, and lyrics, and it's a jukebox musical that would have hits of the 90s, but messed around with so that they work for the story. And um, let's see, the people that, uh, producers that did Urine, in town and Tommy and Jersey Boys, they're, they're really, they know how to do this shit. Um, so they're the producers. And um, now we're going to start to have, we've been, we had a couple little readings just for ourselves to hear it. And, um, you know, that's really, Didi Khan came and read Miss Geist. Oh, wow. And she was cool. Um, and it was just, you know, fun people coming in and out and doing stuff. And now we're going to have, you know, Broadway has a certain, like, you do one reading that's a 29-hour reading where they, like, you know, pay, and then they start paying actors, actually. So then it gets a little more real. Um, and then you workshop it and do all that. Uh, you know, I, I have to watch that show Smash to see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> But so, do you even have like an estimated date when we might oh, see it? Oh, I just keep saying, when? I'm not going to do it. When are we going to do it? And they go, no, Broadway's different. <laughs> it's a different pace. You know, you only get one shot, and it could go on and on. And it's not like you have to find the one share. You'll find a lot of shares. And it's like, but, 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 what if she's not good? We've got to find the best share. And it's like, no, there will be many shares. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, kind of like a whip it when you come home. It's just jumping up and down all of you and they're like, no, no, no. Um, because it's like, if it doesn't work, that's the end of it. But if it works, it just goes on and on. So calm down and don't worry about it. Just make it work. So have you started the casting process yet? or um, You know, there's been people that have come into the readings that I like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Wally, of course, I want, <laughs> but he's also doing another play in England, so, you know, it depends on, maybe he won't be around for the workshop or this or that, but I know, I know I want Wally, and he says, if you want me, I'm there, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's all cool. All right, well, I've asked you enough questions, uh, I think, so I want to open it up to the audience if anybody has questions for, for Amy. Feel free to... Or for Jen. Yep. I, I, I'm really here, just next to her. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, wow, that's a lot louder than I thought. Um, you mentioned, like, sequels and all that stuff, but I'm just curious how much pressure you're under now with these, like, retro r sequels that are happening, like Zoolander, Ghostbusters, all these are, like, 
it feels like the, the studios really want to like cash that in. Are you are you getting? Yeah, it's almost like reboots, but they're like sequels, like many years later, like Zoolander. I don't know what they're doing with it. <laughs> but uh, is there any pressure for on you to or sell your rights or something to get Clueless two out there? No, no, no. Um, you know, this is. I want this musical to happen, um, and. Uh, No, I, you know what? I don't even know if it made enough money for them to care about that. Although, I mean, Zoolander didn't make that much, but um, I have friends whose movies are like multiple, like Harold Ramis. There's vacations coming out. They're making another Ghostbusters. I'm sure in two seconds we'll be reading about a new Groundhog Day reboot or whatever. Um, my friend Marty Brest is like, they were rebooting Midnight Run and Beverly Hills Cop and you know, it's like everything is getting rebooted If somebody wanted to reboot it, would you be able to stop them if you didn't want them to do it? Um, I think well see I'm the writer so I think I have some rights. Yeah <laughs> I mean if you directed something and you could have written a lot about uh, on it, but if you're not the writer you like my friend Marty is like he, he reads about the stuff they're doing to his movies that nobody even asked him about. <laughs> Hello. Um, just curious, when you chose Emma as sort of your base, I was curious if you thought about any other Jane Austen books or would you ever do another movie based off another Jane Austen book? Well, I love her to death. Um, I think sort of Pride and Prejudice was done with, you know, Bridget Jones. Um, Sense and Sensibility, I don't know. It's also like so much of Jane Austen is about the financial shit that was going on because of the lack of rights that women had. I mean, women couldn't have property. And so a lot of their love life was taken up with the situation of them not having the right to their own home. Um, and you're either going to be the little aunt in the little house on the side, or you know you would marry somebody that uh, you maybe don't care about. So Emma was great because it didn't deal with that. It was very modern. What did you think of the fancy music video? <laughs> I think they owe me money. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to hear that though. <laughs> I can see you tweeted and everybody will be mad at me. <laughs> um, You've done a lot of, st sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, you've done a lot of coming of age stories, so maybe not always writing them, but directing them. And there seems to sort of be a quiet time, I think, in the past couple of years where there hasn't been as many coming of age stories where you're telling the teenage point of view. Um, is that something that you would be interested looking at again, or is there any one that you think is doing it in a similar or a strong way? You know, I think there are a lot, but they're in a, uh, they've been given over to a very low budget ghetto. And you know, you can find them on Netflix or on demand or on, you know, but you can't like uh, go to a theater on a Saturday night and buy popcorn and see them, um, which is sad. And also I think it wouldn't be bad if they had a little bit more oomph to them, a little bit more pop music that you pay for a little bit and a little bit more production value. I mean, you know, some lighting and some clothes. <laughs> Although it's interesting, uh, the next reboot of Spider-Man, which I guess is what, the third one in the past 15 years or something? Yeah. Um, they're describing that as a John Hughes version of Spider-Man. And so you, we, we've seen these kind of, those bigger budget kind of movies that Amy was talking about. Some of those are kind of coming of age stories, like The Hunger Games and, and arguably Spider-Man. Um, but it doesn't feel the same as a movie like Clueless or you know, The Breakfast Club, where it's really about a life that a teenager might actually recognize. That's what I think we're missing. Yeah. Hi, 
So you mentioned about like uh, passing it around to different production and that like the name was throwing it off. So had you ever thought about like change the name so people would pick it up? Well, actually, I, I had a bunch of different names because um, sometimes you write a lot of drafts of something and then you can't remember what's in which draft. So I thought if I had different names, I would remember it. So one was called No Worries. And one was called I Was a Teenage Teenager. And um, then actually, Clueless was really Clueless in California. But when people talked about it, they just kept dropping that. Because then it was like Sleepless in Seattle. So I thought, how about Clueless in California? Um, so, there, but I think once they saw what the material was, they were afraid. And also, they weren't real big with like movies that have a female protagonist. Um, in your process of writing, do you find yourself working on like different projects at the same time, or do you sit down and like tend to write like one project at a time, or, or is it just kind of a process of like, oh, I have an idea for this, like a chapter of this, or? Well, I. I I try to do one thing at a time. Sometimes you pressure to do something else, or like, just do this, just do that, do that. And, you know, um, I'm happiest when I'm deeply into one thing. But um, agents and stuff, they, they think, oh, you could just do this. It's like, no, I can't. I'm not, you know, I can't just do it. It's hard. <laughs> Um, can I ask a question to Jen? Of course. Um, I'm really glad that a book like this exists. I love Clueless. Um, how was the process of getting all the like interviews and stuff together? How did that come about? It was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mainly because uh, because we wanted the book to come out at this moment when we're all celebrating the 20th anniversary. That meant that I had to write the initial manuscript in about six months. And then we had, you know, two or three months of kind of going through edits where I was still able to get some interviews in at the last minute. But that's a really accelerated timeline for a book like this where, you know, I talked to more than 60 people. Um, I would have loved to have a year. <laughs> um, so it was, it was hard just trying to, in some cases I had to track people down. Um, you know, uh, Herb Hall, who uh, is the, the real Mr. Hall, who appears in the movie as the principal, but he was um, a, a teacher. He was a debate teacher. He let me sit in his class at Beverly Hills High School. And uh, I tracked him down through his wife. Um, who, I'm now friends with both of them on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> And, um, you know, people's siblings, just, there were some people I, I, you know, who didn't have publicists and entourages that I could go through. Um, and actually, those were the easier people to get to because once I found somebody who was willing to help me, um, they were more than happy to talk. And that was one of the nice things about the book, actually, was, you know, getting a chance to talk to some of the people who worked on this movie who really never get interviewed. And they have good, interesting stories, and they have really strong, strong memories of what was going on um, when they were working on the project, too. So, um, as challenging, challenging as it was, it also made it really fun. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, the first question was, is, what was it about the idea of a musical, or what was it about the actual, like, original story that made you feel like, okay, I could see this in a musical setting that made you say okay to the project? Um, well, I love musicals, and um, I just, if you say, oh, pick a world to live in, I'd say, I'd say, I'd like to live in Bye Bye Birdie. Um, it's, you know, it's just fun, it's, uh, I love going to musicals, um, not the heavy ones, but the ones where it's like, really, everybody just, is like, singing and dancing, and so, it's so exciting when they're right there. Um, and also when we were making the movie, I kind of felt like, you know, we're moving through here and then they'll say that and this will happen, that happens, and then I'd always feel like, and then they'll burst into song. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they couldn't, but I, I felt like that was like it, two steps away. That's great. And then the second question is, are there any other female characters in fiction or that you're interested in or that you've kind of like seeped into your work? 
Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Um, and not the movie, but the book, uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Anita Luce, um, Lorelei. Uh, I just love her positive attitude. It's like when she goes, oh, intellectual guys uh, like to have a salon. Um, so I'm going to have one in my hotel room, and I'll have all the smart guys come over. And then the next day, she's like really got a headache, and she's got to get the underwear off the chandelier. And it's like, boy, smart guys go through a lot of liquor. And <laughs> um, she's just like in this uh, other world where she's trying to create something. She totally doesn't know how. Um, and she's just really optimistic about what she'll be able to do. And that like blows my mind, like, oh, who said you can do all that? All right, this will be your last question for the night. Hi. Um, once you decided to base Clueless off of Emma, um, I'm wondering how you got to the point where you really made the story your own and you really like made the characters your own and like how how did you like further develop the characters and what was that process like well are there a lot of people that read emma okay um one thing i wanted to do at first was see how share functions when it works right and in emma it seemed like almost from like the first couple of pages, she was very confident because she already hooked up her nanny with a guy. And so she was already feeling like she's really good at doing this. But I wanted to see that process. So I put in more of her actually making the teachers fall in love and making that, so the first act would be about her doing the thing that made her so confident. Um, in Emma also, there was like a kind of a character that I, I don't know if she really functions as somebody that you think Emma should have been friends with, as opposed to, to Harriet, um, the Jane Fairchild. And I never really liked Jane Fairchild. She just seemed like, I mean, you know, she was kind of annoyed because her boyfriend was being, you know, flirty and attentive to somebody else and she had to keep this secret and she was in a bad mood and um, and I really felt like we didn't really get to know her anyway and I didn't see why we should like her so much more than Harriet because Harriet was not that bright or whatever and should have it was just kind of flighty um, but left her own devices she would have been much better off and much more down to earth and sweet and nice and loving to the right person um, so I kind of took out that f Jane Fairchild. I wanted, she thinks that this guy likes her and she's wrong. So rather than Jane Fairchild, there was the fact that he was gay. And, because um, I thought it's more important that she's self-deluding than there's somebody that she should try to be like. That, I didn't like that. So, um, I think those are the main hunks that I messed with. And the rest all fell into place. I mean, in so many scenes, just, you know, Jane Austen just had it already mapped out. It's like, we're at a party, and this carriage is going home. Well, who's going with who is going to be important. Because two people thrown together, you know, things can happen. How do you manipulate that situation? And, you know, how do you decide who will be in what carriage? Well, other than the fact that it's like based on which freeway to take, it's, I mean, it, it's so modern, it's so perfect, and it's so emotionally correct for what was going on. So, so many things like that of like, here's the stuff I saved from this guy and now I want to burn it. Well, I mean, you know, it was the plaster on his finger, you know, when they used plaster to, for a wound or whatever the hell. Um, Anyhow, but it all, the stupid shit you say from somebody because you like them. That doesn't change. I mean, the stuff changes. Um, but I, I just, uh, she had so many things that worked perfectly. 
if that makes sense. Well, that was, uh, that was really great. Thanks so much for coming out. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thanks, guys.